Lecture 21. Um, we're going to general. We're going to talk about the muscles again and talk about what happens when things like gluteus medius don't work properly. It's called Trendelenburg gait, and it's a kind of problem that wouldn't be intuitive based on what you think the medial gas, the medial gluteus does, medium gluteus. The sciatic nerve, you know, it's the biggest nerve in the body, but it has two parts. And each of those parts supply different muscles. And in fact, uh, each part has some parts you're gonna have to learn as well. Some just down the leg. We're gonna talk about an area of interest now that's at the back of your knee called the popliteal fossa as well. Because a lot of the stuff, once we finish the hamstring, we basically finish the upper part of your lower leg. So, reviewing what we did last time, we talked about the adductor group, the medial compartment group. And they stick uh, pectineus in this, where it is, up here, there, right there. So pectineus will run from the ridge of the pubis down towards the pectin line, which is just below the canter. So that partially involves going backwards and behind. So it's a bit of a weak, but significant in its own way at flexing the hip, but also it's kind of grouped with the adductor, so it also adducts. The hard thing to get in your head, and you have to see this in the lab, is as the hip bone, or the head of the femur starts to internally rotate, the line between the pectineus and the center of rotation of the head of the femur actually gets bigger. So as you get into internal rotation, you get stronger and stronger at internally rotating the hips as well. We'll talk about that at the end. The thing about pectineus is it primarily is femoral nerve, but also has a bit of obturator every now and then. Sometimes, rarely, it's all obturator. And it looks just like an adductor, so that's why we review it here. Um, it's actually technically in the more anterior compartment, because it's a flexor. The other ones are adductor longus, brevis, and magnus. So, Here's one for adductor longus, again, right from the front of the pubis down, and they're all inserting on the posterior line, linea alba of the femur. So these lines are actually dotted in your textbook because although they're showing you an entering view of the femur, they're actually attaching posteriorly to the linea uh, aspect, sorry, the posterior aspect of the femur. So first you have longus, above it you would have brevis, and then deep to those, would be adductor magnus, or the here. It's a big, big muscle. Strong muscle, thick muscle, broad attachment. Again, running from the hole, basically from the front of the pubis all the way back to the issue of fibrosity. So going from way in front of the hip joint to way behind the hip joint, all the way along there is taking one attachment. And the more anterior components and middle components are called the true adductor part. Comes down and starts almost on the whole medial part of the shaft posteriorly on the femur. It's a big, big, big muscle. It has also a hamstring component that takes its origin way back in visual chondrosity with the hamstring muscles we'll talk about today. It comes down and inserts onto the adductor tubercle. So all of these will be very strong at adducting the hip. So you're very, very strong at bringing the legs together, squeezing the legs together. Last one's gracilis, takes its origin again just from the front end of the pubis, runs down, and this one actually crosses the knee joint and inserts down on the front medial side of the tibia. So it's going to have a weak capability to flex, not a lot, because it's almost right down the center of the knee joint. And it'll be another weak, what we'll call hip adductor. It's actually very, very thin muscle, kind of like sartorius. So, the last one, obturator externus, takes its attachment from the external surface of the obturator foramen, so basically the whole rim, and there's a membrane on that. It covers 99% of that hole. It also attaches to that. It comes out and forms a tight, tight tendon that passes behind the neck of the femur and inserts right into a groove slightly posterior uh, between the greater trochanter and the posterior surface of the femur. So it doesn't it's not very far away from the head, so we always think of this one as being sure. It's, a, it's going to want to adduct the head, but more importantly, it's going to basically grab the femur and pull it into the acetabulum. 
affect all the adductors kind of want to do that. They want to keep the head of the femur locked into the acetabulum. So in Priscillus, uh, obturator uh, externus, both the magnus, uh, uh, the adductor part of magnus, longus, and brevis are all supplied by the obturator nerve. It's just a kind of funny little pectineus, and then the hamstring component, the posterior aspect that actually takes its origin with the hamstrings, goes down and attaches to this tubercle down here. That is supplied by the tibial component of the sciatic nerve. Okay. You'll see the hamstrings, where it takes one of its attachments from, say initial tuberosity, are all supplied, well, almost the hamstrings are all supplied with the tibial component of the sciatic nerve. Okay, again, I'll point out the adductor hiatus, because this is where your femoral vessels, artery and vein, as they pass down through here, they take a, the terminal cutaneous branch of the femoral nerve with them. They will pass through that adductor hiatus to go from the medial compartment of the thigh to go down posterior to the knee joint when they become the popliteal vessels. Okay. We also talked about the region of interest in the thigh called the femoral triangle, supported by uh, sartorius on one side, adductor longus on the other, and the roof is all fascia. There's nothing really there except fascia and a bit of fat. But coming underneath the inguinal ligaments, which sort of forms the base of your femoral triangle, we have the big femoral nerve, femoral artery, and femoral vein. So nerve, artery, vein, and any of it's the order of them from lateral to medial. They come down and they pass through, sort of below, if you wish, the uh, so, uh, the sartorius, and that's where the profunda vessels will either vein, join the vein, or artery will come off the artery. And then that whole system will run in behind the adductor and the adductor canal, so the adductor longus. Again, until they hit the adductor hiatus and pass behind the knee to become the popliteal vessels. Uh, we also talked about the posterior lateral muscles, and this is the image from more that you have. Um, basically, two layers. The main one on the first layer, where a gluteus maximus, right here. Okay. Broad attachment, posterior aspect of the ilium, all along that sort of posterior aspect of the sacrum, posterior sacroiliac joints as well, and the sacrotuberous, sacrospinous, well, sacro, sacrotuberous ligament primarily. So big, broad, thick, thick muscle. 25% of it will come down and insert onto the gluteal tuberosity and the posterior aspect of the femur. And about 75% of it blends in to the iliotibial tract or the, the tensor fasciolatus tract of the lateral side of your thigh. It's the fascia that basically supports the lateral part of your, lateral part of your thigh. So I always liken it the gluteus has got a weak purchase on the femur, but it's kind of grabbing your pant leg and trying to pull that into posterior as well. It's grabbing the fascia instead of the actual uh, bone. So very, very strong abductor of the hip, very strong extensor. And the more the hips flex, the more lengthened gluteus is, the stronger it is. So that's the one that will get you out of your seat when you want to stand up. It's very powerful and rising from a seating position. Its nerve supply is the inferior gluteal nerve, I believe. The other two that are similar named, we have gluteus medius, deep to it, so you have to cut away the gluteus maximus, you get medius. So if you look on the side of the ilium, the posterior aspect of the ilium, posterior lateral aspect, it's a big honking red attachment on those skeletons in the lab. That is the whole area that medius comes from. And if you reflect it away, you end up with minimus. So minimus is deep to that. So you can see their broad attachment. They both will insert onto the greater trochanter. The medius is almost dead center right over top of the center of rotation of the joint. Minimus is more attaching to the sort of anterior part of the trochanter. But if you look at the fibers, the anterior parts of these fibers, for medius and minimus, they have a line going backwards. So they are also going to be able to internally rotate the femur. Their primary job is abducting. The last one is tensor fascia lata. It's basically from the front of the uh, ilium, the uh, anterior superior spine. It's going to come down and it's going to blend in again with this 
iliotibial tract, fascia on the lateral side of the leg. The latent gluteus both insert into that fascia. And that fascia runs all down the lateral side of your leg and it attaches to a tubercle just in the front of the tibia on the lateral surface called the girder tubercle. The whole band covers the whole lateral side of your knee, almost dead center of rotation to the knee joint. So the gluteus, tensor fascia lateral contract, they pull on the fascia vertically, and they can help to lock the knee joint in extension. So if you're quietly standing, you just need to activate those two muscles, and they'll help keep you in a locked, extended knee position while standing. Okay, uh, medius minimus, and I think tensor fascia lateral are the uh, superior gluteal group. So just apply that. Because tensor fascia lateral is out here, again, anterior to the center of the hip rotation, it will also help with medial rotation of the hip. And it kind of wants to flex the hip a bit. And because it's lateral to the center rotation of the femur, it also wants to abduct. So it's functioning on its own. It kind of wants to do something like that. And if you really want, it will turn the work to as well. Those are the superficial layer. I hope the deep ones here. Yep, deep ones are here too. So the deeper ones, piriformis is the first of those. And from the front of the sacrum, now it's going to get out to attach itself to the greater trochanter of the femur. So it comes out the greater sciatic notch before it attaches onto a basically the almost dead center on the inside of the, um, of the greater trochanter. Next to it, coming from the inside, this is a hard one you have to get basically the image from the lab, is from the inside of the pelvis, on the inside of the uh, obturator foramen and the membrane that covers it is obturator internus. So it has to get out of there somehow. And what it does is it basically goes posteriorly and then turns 90 degrees and the tendon runs right underneath the spine, the ischial spine, and fires itself over to insert next to piriformis on the inside of the greater trochanter. So just like the external um, obturator, obturator externus, they insert very close to each other. They're both passing behind the center rotation of the femur. They're both attaching back here, okay? But this one pulls a funny little 90 degree curve, so it's important to look at the lab and figure where that is happening. As it curls around the spine, it grabs both the superior gemellus from its attachment above the spine and the inferior gemellus, which is attached just below the spine. So on the spines, on the colored skeleton, you'll see two little red dots. The bottom one is the superior one, the bottom one is the inferior one. And they blend there with the internus and attach to the same location. I think of them as guides. They're not very thick in a cadaver, but they're going to basically help to pull the obturator internus tendon to help generate a force going back towards the spine of the issue. And then that's transferred to the obturator internus. The superior gemellus has the same nerve as the nerve for obturator internus. It's called the nerve to obturator internus. And the inferior gemellus has the same nerve supply as the last one, which is the quadratus femoris right here. The quadratus femoris takes its attachment from just the medial side of the issue of tuberosity and runs to its own tubercle, quite a distance actually from the head of the femur on the posterior aspect of the femur called the quadrate tubercle. The quadrate it looks like a little square, but again, in the cadaver, it's not trivial. It's actually quite a little thick little guy. Okay. And all these make up basically what are called the lateral rotators. So because they all pass behind the head of the paper's rotation center, and you'll see in a second what I mean, in the standing position, they all want to externally rotate your head. And they're quite strong because you've got gluteus maximus, their big brother, helping them want to do that. So you're very strong in external rotation of the hip. You only have part of medius, part of minimus, and tensor fascia lateral, a little bit of pecuneus on internal rotation. So you're not very strong at that. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's where we got to. We didn't cover the hamstrings, right? This is the stuff I stopped at. So the posterior aspect of the thigh consists of the hamstring. On the medial side, there'll be two. Here they've shown you semitendinosis on the more superior surface. Why? Because as it gets back towards the, just above the knee joint, it becomes a very solid tendon. It curls around the front of the tibia and inserts on the front aspect of the tibia, right next to the gracilis, and right next to the sartorius. You'll see in a second. It takes its attachment from the ischial tuberosity. So it's running all the way from the ischial tuberosity, medially, 
just moving slightly lateral and curling around the front and sort of distally on the top of the tibia. So its location means it's going to want to extend the hip because it's posterior center rotation of the hip joint. It's also going to flex the knee, just like the other hamstrings. Remove it, deep to it, is semimembranosus. Membranosus because its tendon is more membranous as it attaches posteriorly on the posterior, uh, superior aspect of the medial side of the tibia. That's where it primarily attaches, but there's also a rebound to the tendon, which actually crosses posterior to the knee joint. So we get to the knee joint, I don't think, that might be actually Friday. This is called the oblique popliteal ligament. When they remove everything, you can see that there's a big band, connective tissue that runs right around the back of your joint, the capsule of your knee joint, which is actually an extension of the tendon of study membranosus. It's called the oblique popliteal ligament because it runs from bone to the lateral posterior aspect of the femur. It helps thicken the back of the capsule. But its attachment primarily is on the posterior tibial aspect. So leg tendinosis, membranosus, runs on the medial side of the leg, but crosses one attachment to the initial tuberosity, the other is the tibia. So leg ten tendinosis, it wants to extend the hip, but also flex the knee. When you do that, when you're walking, heel contact, you want to extend the hip, you want to fire the knee. Okay, so these guys are built to go into the propulsion phase of locomotion. Rectus femoris wants to do what? Flex the hip, extend the knee. It wants to load the gun and bring the foot out the front. So those muscles are literally designed for locomotion. Okay? On the medial side of the leg is biceps femoris. Biceps meaning it has two components. The long component likewise takes its origin or attachment from the issue of tuberosity and it'll run down and insert onto the head of the fibula. So it crosses the knee joint and functions very much like the other hamstrings on the medial side of the leg, but it's going to the lateral side where it attaches to the head of the fibula. That's the long head. If you reflect it and get it out of the way, here's the long head here, you cut everything out of the way, you'll notice that there's actually a short head for biceps femoris. It takes its origin going halfway down the posterior aspect of the femur, as it gets closer to the tibia and fibula, it blends its tendon in with the long head, and the two of them are the ones that insert into the fibula. The short head doesn't cross the hip joint. The short head of biceps remorse is only a knee flexor, so it's not a hamstring. Colloquial names are the ones that actually cross from the issue of fibrosity to cross the knee joint. Biceps remorse long head, semimembranosis, and tendinosis are true hamstrings. Adductor magnus is a phony. <laughs> the adductor component is real, and the part that goes from ischial tuberosity to the adductor tubercle doesn't cross the knee joint, but they refer to it as the hamstring component because it arises from the same place these guys do. Semimembranosus, tendinosus, hip extensors, knee flexors, long head of biceps, hip extensor, knee flexor, all of those are supplied with a tibial component of the sciatic nerve. Okay. The catch is the short head of biceps femoris is supplied by the other part of the sac called the common fibular nerve. And I learned it as the common perineal nerve. So as we get into the lower leg, you'll see there's a lot of structures that are called fibular. Fibularis longus brevis. I learned them as perineus longus and brevis. So in more, when he says fibular, you may see a bracket that says perineal. You go to anatomy, but other anatomy books or older anatomy books, you won't find a fibular, common fibular nerve. You'll find a common perineal nerve. Okay? Just the name has changed. In more, the other part of the static is called the common fibular nerve. We we'll talk about that in a second. The interesting thing about these guys is if you lengthen them, i.e., you do a hamstring stretch. You really lengthen at the hip by going into flexion, the parts of the hamstrings that want to extend it. You lengthen the parts that want to flex the knee joint. So this is the longest you're going to get on those guys. If you do something like that, well, it's hard. <laughs> now I flex the knee. I've shortened that part of the hamstring. I really tried to stretch the proximal part. So that's how you stretch the proximal part of your hamstring. You offload the knee joint. Okay and then it'll still get at that part. 
But it also means in that position, when the flex knee, the hamstrings aren't that strong if you extend the hip. And now, from going from that position, gluteus is left expanding the hip. So when you're standing up, it's gluteus that gets you going until finally the hamstrings can have some purchase. They're now, the knee is extending, great, and the hip is extending at the same time. That's kind of an odd thing for the hamstrings. They want to flex the knee and extend the hip, not extend the knee and extend the hip. Okay, so keep in mind, some of these biarticular muscles are in a difficult situation for certain tasks. The stride and walking, hamstrings are happy. Standing up, the hamstrings are in a quandary. They want to flex the knee, not extend it. So that's where things can get damaged. Okay. We look and review, here they all are again, different muscles. Um, these are just the newer images from more, so I won't go over these panels. I'll direct you up here. And on this side, you can see where the attachment would be for the basically the head of the biceps femoris. It's right on the where it attaches to the very tip or head of the fibula. Here's the attachment for semimembranosis on the posterior aspect. So they're going to come down and attach there. Here's the other thing from the posterior view. On the front, you're going to see a grouping of three muscles on the medial side of the tibia. Okay. I'll never ask you to identify which is which because they insert really close to each other. They all come from very different places. And this is called paesensorinus. Paesensorinus means goose's foot because of the attachment that the three muscles converge to attach in the tibia, it kind of looks like a goose's foot as they attach. They go to three slightly different locations. Paesensorinus is made up of the attachment for sartorius, gracilis, and semitendinosus. Wow. So gracilis, right down the middle side of your leg, it's an adductor, maybe a weak hip flexor. Weak uh, knee flexor, uh, yeah, knee hip flexor is probably better than hip flexor, more of an adductor. Okay. And it's nerve supply, obturated, fine. Sartorius, way from the anterior superior iliac spine, crosses the femur, curls around the knee joint to attach right next to the psoas. It's nerve supply, femoral. What does sartorius do? Well, it's a weak hip flexor, it's a weak abductor, it's a weak external rotator, and it's a weak knee flexor. The last one we just talked about, Semimembranosis, they're all inserting in the same spot on the tibia. It's nerve supply, tibial nerve of the side. Wow, what does it do? It wants to flex the knee and extend the hip. Now the other thing these hamstrings can do is they basically form, if you grab the back of your knee, they form that webby thing on either side. On the lateral side, that tendon you're grabbing is biceps femoris. On the medial side, the more prominent Inside tendon part is tendinosis, the more juicy muscular part is membranosis. But what they do is if you bend the knee up in deflection, if I contract tendinosis membranosis, I can actually turn the toes in. So you're grabbing the tibia and internally rotating it. So that's how you can test them. Try it in the lab and you'll be able to feel the medial part of your hamstrings pop. Okay? Biceps, because it goes to the outside, doesn't want to just flex the knee, it wants to rotate the tibia laterally. And there's a bit of motion there. And as soon as you do that, there goes the tendon. And there's, that's how you use it. If you're going to try and put surface CMG on, you have someone do this, you'll you know what you're talking about. Okay, so paesensorinus is the attachment for all three of them. And again, in the lab, you'll never get that. You'll never get which is which. But it's a great question to say, what are the three muscles that attach here? What's their nerve supply? Or worse, What's their function? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, you just describe what the function was. They're all different. So, let's go back to motion. You think of extension, well, gluteus maximus, number one guy for extending the hip and abducting it. To a certain extent, you external rotation. So there is your muscle for the speed scoop push. Right, that guy wants to do that. You have the sciatic part, or the hamstring part of adductor magnus, because it's way posterior to the center rotation of the hip, yeah, it's gonna to wanna to extend the hip. So do semitendinosis, biceps, femoris, the hamstring component at least, and semimembranosis. They all want to help with hip extension. And it all depends on where the hip is, how good they are at it, okay? Is the knee flexed? Hamstrings are not gonna be good at extending the hip. The knee's extended, hamstrings are very happy to help to extend the hip until you get into full extension, 
then there are weak deflexes. Okay? It could still do it. So just think what's going to happen to the muscle with a two joint motion. You can think of abduction, sure enough, gluteus medius and minimus, they are the key hip abductors. Medius, especially, the middle component of it is right over the center rotation. And it's thick, but it's a big attachment to the ilium. So it's your strongest hip abductor. The anterior components are also medial rotators. We'll come back to that. The problem is medius, minimus, and tensor fascia lata are all supplied to the same nerve. If it's paralyzed, you're incredibly weak now at abduction of the hip. So what is abduction of the hip? It's stabilizing the pelvis in mid-swing. So when you lift your foot off the ground, the only thing that's preventing the pelvis from collapsing to that side is the abductor moment created by minimus, medius, and to some extent tensor fascia lata. In this position, you're actually abducting the hip, it's isometric. If you don't, you move into adduction, right? So this is called Trendelenburg. And when you watch the gate, I saw someone on the other day exactly doing this. You have the Trendelenburg sign. And if you notice at the beginning, as we go walking away from the camera, that's Trendelenburg, okay? But you can't activate the left side. So she, as soon as she gets weight on the left leg, the right side pelvis collapses. So there's a paralysis in here. Okay, nerve supply to medius minimus are gone. So it causes this very characteristic whap when they're walking. And because they don't have the same stability in the pelvis, you have to compensate. If you watch her, she flexes a little bit more and does something funny with her leg. You see her leg come swinging through. So zip, instead of just swinging straight through, she can't. She's collapsed. You compensate either by flexing more, or you change the path of your leg. You bring your leg in and out to cover the ground. And this is a classic trend, trend, on your trend down per case. Adductors. Who are they for that? Well, pectineus, longus, brevis, magnus, and to some extent even gracilis, they all can adduct the hip. They're primarily obturator. From here, you lose the obturator nerve, and you got to hope the pectineus is fully engaged with femoral innervation, where you're incredibly weak now at bringing that leg in at adduction. The complexors, the anterior components of minimus and medius, while they can internally rotate, they're also in front of the center of rotation. So at the start, especially if you're in a way extended position, they're going to want to help to flex the hip. Not all of it, just the anterior fibers. The bigger ones, like tensor fascia lata, are already in front of the hip. Yeah, they'll help with flexion of the hip. Iliosoas, your primary hip flexor. Remember, it's a big, juicy muscle. It curls over the brim of the pelvis, goes back and attaches to the lesser trochanter. If that hip extends and you're in an upright position, it's desperate to pull the leg through. That's what it's meant to do, flex the hip. Again, they talk about brevis, longus, magnus, gracilis even, as hip flexors, but it's only you move it into extension out of the anatomical position because now you've lengthened all those adductors so they want to flex the hip from an extended position they want to extend the hip from a flexed position and again we talked about how that's how you pull one of those uh, adductor muscles uh, last one would be sectorial well second last one is sectorius remember because it crosses the hip joint in front of it it's a weak hip flexor the rectus femoris by articular muscle to the extensor but it passes in front of the hip joint. So like iliopsoas, it's actually quite a strong hip flexor, especially if the hip is extended. So again, it really wants to flex the hip. The problem for it is if the leg is straight. Now, it can't extend the knee, so it's not as strong. So when you move the leg up into a straight leg position like this, rectus right femoris has been shortened at the hip, it's shortened at the knee. What's holding this here? Iliopsoas is holding this here because rectus can't contribute. It's off load. It's too short. Okay, and you can test those in the lab to see which strength you have depending on what the knee and ankle, uh, knee and hip look like. Medial rotators, uh, yeah, minimus and medius, the anterior fibers, tensor fascia lata. He doesn't include pectineus, but to some extent pectineus does. They talk about membranosus and tendinosus down here. I'm not sure how. Pauling said it's determined they're involved in medial rotation. 
They come from the issue of tuberosity and they attach to the back of the knee. So I'm thinking in this figure, he's actually talking about medial rotation of the tibia, which I talked about before, because they can do that. Your knee is flexed and you contract them. They can actually help you internally rotate the tibia. I don't remember the degrees, maybe five to seven degrees. Think of the lateral rotators. Big gluteus maximus is obviously able to do that. Then you have the more posterior fibers of medius minimus may contribute to a bit of lateral rotation because they're back here. And if they insert there, they can help trying to turn the head of the femur into an external position. They're joined by the small guys, piriformis, obturator internus, and the gemellis, and the quadratus, uh, obturator externus, and there's quadrator, quadrator femoris. So all of these, because they're behind the head of the femur, they want to externally rotate in a standing position. But what I'll challenge you to do is in the lab, look what happens to what they can do when you flex your hip to about 90 degrees. Okay. Instead of running behind the femur, like this, you now flex everything up, and they're posterior to the femur, on top of it. So they laterally rotate a flexed hip. So this is called horizontal abduction. That's the deep lateral rotators that are accomplishing that. Okay. So if they're weak, you might be weak in external rotation, put someone into a, hip, a flexed hip and ask them to bring the leg laterally, they can't, okay, they're paralyzed for that. So those are the motions. The nerve, sciatic nerve, comes peeking out through, in the majority of cases, underneath piriformis. So it exits, remember it's the combination of L4, L5, the lumbosacral trunk, joining us as one, two, and three, the top of the sacral plexus, they all form that sciatic nerve. And it's going to exit through the greater sciatic foramen with piriformis. And it's going to usually come out underneath it. So as you dissect away gluteus maximus, you can actually find the sciatic nerve, and as soon as you trace it back up and watch it disappear, the muscle over the top of it is piriformis, which is a pretty good muscle, actually. As the sciatic nerve comes down, the back of your leg is buried behind the biceps femoris long head. And as it gets closer to the top of the back of the knee, where this is the popliteal fossa, it divides into its major components. On the medial part of this, the nerve is called the tibial nerve. And on the lateral part, just as biceps is coming down to a tendon to attach to the fibula, it kind of follows the line of the, of the biceps tendons. They're called the common fibular nerve. Now, actually, if you were to dissect and cut through the sciatic nerve just below piriformis, again, the nerve is very, very oval-like. It's about a centimeter wide in a human, but in fact, if you were to cut through it, you'd see this. Common fibular, tibial. So all the axons in here are going to go where the tibial nerve goes. All the axons in here are going where the common fibular goes. It's just it doesn't decide to divide and separate most time until you get to the back of the knee. Okay? But they're separate to begin with. They're just housed within this big thing that's like called the sciatic nerve. But they don't supply anything in your butt. The first thing they start to supply are the hamstrings. So the first thing they ever have any impact on. So here's an example of the sciatic nerve coming down. The medial part is the tibial nerve, passes right through the popliteal fossa. You'll see that in a second. The lateral component is called the common fibular nerve. Why? Because it courses laterally, it follows the biceps tendon, and it curls around right next to the head of the fibula. So this again with a point now. So if you flex the knee, you can actually feel the head of your fibula right there on the side of the knee, bony thing right just posterior, inferior to your knee joint. You go below that, you push, it might feel pins and needles or it might hurt a bit, but you're pressing on the common fibular nerve, okay? So it's right there. So here is the rarity. About 12.5% of you, 200 people in here, just think about that, there's a few of you, where the sciatic nerve is actually split before it's left the problem. <coughs> The tibial component will come out below piriformis just like the rest of the sciatic nerve people do. But the 
common to the part might actually be coming right through the piriformis. So that can cause problems over time. You're repeatedly contracting and relaxing this muscle, you're basically pinching the common fibular nerve. Okay, that's not good. The other thing that can happen, rarely, I've only seen this once on the cadaver, is instead of coming both underneath the piriformis, the tibia goes below, and the common fibular comes from above. Then they carry on in this common sheath, that eventually divide when they get down to the popliteal fossa. So these do happen. And Either case, piriformis syndrome, etc., doesn't necessarily mean it happens because the piriformis is huge and it's compressing the sciatic. It could be as huge because it's basically compressing one part of the sciatic. So it depends on where the symptoms come from. If you have a really tight hip, you have a tight piriformis, and the physio is giving you stretches to do, etc., etc., it may or may not help things depending on what situation you have. Okay? So here are the pictures from Moore. Uh, again, with the blood supply, showing that where the, the lumbosacral plexus basically gives rise to the femoral nerve, how it pops up through here. Here's the same image I just showed you. Area of interest, if you're getting a shot from somebody for an injection, is to go up above the top part lateral border of your hip. Why? Because there's no chance of hitting even the sciatic nerve or the major branches to the uh, gluteus medius and minimus, so the superior gluteal nerve is up in here. So they're usually going to inject you right on the lateral side of your hip. Plus, gluteus maximus is as big as you see there. So it's a perfect place for an injured muscular injection. The hip joint, yeah, it was one of the first ones that went through artificial replacement, if you wish. My dad had this done. It's not his x-ray. Um, what happens over time, of course, is the head and the acetabulum, the head of the femur acetabulum, they're chronically dealing with half your body weight or more, and they get pounded and grounded. And you start to get all kinds of weird things that are arthritic happening, and eventually it can really become painful and just uncomfortable. So you remove the neck of the femur, you put in the cup where the acetabulum would be, you put a mental shunt down into the shaft of the femur. They've left a lot of the femur here, they've just taken the neck and the head away, they left the trochanter in place. And this, usually the, the variety of materials are used. Sometimes the queens are experimenting with this shaft being porous. So you looked at it, it looked like a cheese grater, and they'd shove it down into the femur, and they glue it there. But it was porous because they were trying to encourage bone to then grow into this thing. Some of it works, some of it doesn't work. But these things can last, they used to last about 10 to 15 years, now they last about 35. So some people are getting their hips done when they're 50 if they're really bad uh, arthritic hip. And they'll take them for the rest of their life. Uh, my dad actually fell and broke the neck of his femur when he was about 85, so they had to replace his hip. And then I did my PhD at Queens in the anatomy department. And he had, when I was younger, he donated his body to Queens. And then we found out I got in at Queens for my PhD in the anatomy department. And I went, Dad, uh, we can't both go to Queens at the same time. You have to wait till I'm done my PhD before you decide to pass on. It's a great threat. But he was so happy when he finally donated his body when he passed away because he was just waiting for the medical students to start working on his hip, only to find out he had an artificial hip. He also had a stun in his heart and had a fake left eye. The guy was a complex person. <laughs> he had a lot of repair stuff too. And he thought, wouldn't it be great? They'll be going in and I'll be going to try and look at my eye and the student will go, it's not there. Or they'll be trying to find his hip and go, his hip's not here. There's something plastic in So my father had a wicked sense of humor. He eventually did go to Queens, but I was well past the graduate at that time. So if you think of the hip from the ligaments and what they're supposed to do, and the muscles are what they're supposed to do. It's a nice figure in more. This is the check uh, from the more five, but the exact same figure in more six. It's a bird's eye view of the head of the femur and the acetabulum. And as I said before, there's only a few muscles that are internal rotators. There's a whole lot that are lateral rotators. Okay? So these arrows sort of symbolically represent the kind of torque you can generate. But if you think of what the ligaments do, and the arrows here are resisting, if you wish. Things like iliofemoral, sure, it hates extension of the hip, but it's also not gonna like lateral rotation. So it gets tight when you try to move the hip into lateral rotation. Those two bands are gonna tighten up. So that's why more gives it a bit of a resistance there. Pubofemoral, remember it's underneath here. It's the posterior inferior aspect of the capsule. 
So it's going to hate that much. It's going to pull the head in instead. Little iliopharyngeal femoral, the thin one on the back, they say sometimes it can resist a bit of internal rotation because it curls over the top of the femur. As you move the femur into internal rotation, it would tighten a bit. But really, all of them, if you move the hip into extension, they all tighten. Okay. So it's a nice balance between muscle and ligaments and how you can get away with it. Um, again, another bird's eye view of the femur and how it fits in with the acetabulum. The red line is sort of the line of this, around the center of rotation, which is right there. So anything that would pass in front of this line is going to be an internal rotator. So things like tensor fasciolata, gluteus medius, and minimus, their anterior fibers, are in front of the line. So if they contract, they're going to want to torque you this way. Okay? If you think of anything in green, they're going to want to have a bit of a city in external rotation. The one that passes right below and very close to center rotation, here, obturator externus. But again, look in the anatomy lab. It has to come from underneath and curls right around the neck to insert. There's not a lot it can do. There's a very, very gentle distance from the center rotation called the bone arm that's going to want to do weak external rotation. Something like gluteus maximus, way out here, okay, it's starting to generate force back here. It's going to want to really externally rotate the hip. Guys like obturator internus has to pull this 90 degree turn, but because it goes underneath the spine and joins up with the two gemelles here, the line of force would be that way and redirected here. It's going to, again, want to open the door. And lastly, you have quadratus femoris deep down here, or pure formis is another one. They're all going to want to do this. So you have this powerful external rotation in the anatomical position. Look in the lab, when you flex your hip, the thing changes into horizontal abduction. Okay. The small ones, anyway. Okay. Scary, scary figure for more highly useful, very useful, for motion of the hip. You notice everything is color-coded and set around the hip. So this is the basically the right hip. They remove the femur. You're looking into the acetabulum from the side. And they actually put up everything in colors. If you work your way through it, you can sort of figure out, okay, this red line up here, this represents where the medial rotators would have to come if they're going to take the head of the femur and rotate it immediately. And what would they be? They've got gluteus minimus and medius, the anterior parts and tensor fasciolata. I put in here pectineus because Moore said that in the book, but isn't put in the table. In the lab, you'll see once you start to internally rotate, pectineus moves more and more in front of the center of rotation of the femur and helps to, re to continue with internal rotation. You go to the external rotators, these guys here, or lateral rotators, there they are right there, all the ones we just talked about. Clearly want to take the femur and rotate it laterally. Same for flexors and extensors. Extensors in yellow, all the, um, they're all here. All the flexors are in purple, they're all listed up here. And then finally you have what are these adductors. Yeah, the adductors would be down here. All of these we talked about as adductors from the medial compartment, or here are the adductors down here. Gluteus medius minimus and tensor fasciola. That's a very useful table. It's frightening to look at the beginning, but it's a list of all the muscles that do the different motion. But it summarizes it perfectly. Okay. So I like that figure very much. It took them a long time, I'm sure, to do that. The only one I was curious about was this one. Okay, region of interest, back of your knee. It's called the popliteal fossa. It's bounded by the biceps femoris, uh, long head and joining the short head is the tendon on one side, and the uh, semitendinosus membranosus from the other side, and it's diamond shaped. Looks like a little diamond here, because it's actually a potential space. There's nothing that covers that area in between except fascia. So when you flex your leg, you sort of bring the diamond together. If you extend your leg, you're opening up the diamond at the back. Two muscles you haven't heard about are the gastrocnemius medial lateral heads. They form the base of the diamond. So it is literally diamond shaped and it's right in the back of your knee. Okay. So borders are biolateral gastrox, biceps femoris on one side, semi tendinosus membranosus on the other. 
Why is it important? Because posterior to the femur, so the posterior aspect of the femur and the top part of the tibia are going to form the base of this, basically the background of it, is where the common fibular nerve leaves the tibial nerve, follows the head, or basically the tendon of biceps femoris to curl on the head of the fibula. Tibia goes right through, tibial nerve goes right through the center, basically bisects the popliteal fossa. And it's about 10 to 12 millimeters under the skin. So it's right there at the back of your knee. And the only thing on top of it is a thick band of fascia. So if I'm going to put a needle into that, that's where it would go, right there. And it goes straight down to the back of your knee, and then I can record from whatever's in there. Deep to it are the tibial vein first, and then the deepest structure running right along the femur is going to be the, the popliteal artery. So remember, as they go through the abductor hiatus, femoral vessels become popliteal vessels. So they are heavily protected, if you wish, on all sides except the basic back of the popliteal fossa. The back of the knee is meant to flex and extend, extension being the full limit of its motion. So tibial nerve is on the most superficial, in between is the popliteal vein, and deepest of all is the, is the popliteal artery. And as they come down and go behind, medial lateral gastrox, a little different nerves come up, you don't have to know, but it's just the common fibular one. This is where roughly that small saphenous vein, if it's still coming up, will insert into the popliteal vein. Okay. So remember that this is the equivalent of the cephalic in the arm. It never crosses the knee joint. It dives down deep, dumps its blood in there. And that's the popliteal fossa. The common fibular nerve, as it comes around the head of the fibula, Remember, it's the thing that supplies the, basically the short head of biceps. For Morris, as it curls around, you can feel it about there, but it immediately gives off two branches. One double branch is called the deep fibular branch. It's going to supply some of the muscles on the front of your leg, of your lower leg. And the superficial fibular nerve is going to supply two of the muscles on the side of your leg, lower leg. So these are the two branches, deep fibular and and superficial fibular that you have to know have come from the common fibular and where they come off, right here. Because they're going to supply some of the muscles we're going to be talking about either on Friday and Monday. Uh, not Monday. Friday and the following Monday, because you don't have a lecture next Monday. Okay? So this is a figure from more. Again, you don't have to worry about the blood supply, other than to realize, again, there's this massive anastomosis around the knee joint, so if you include something, you can get blood from somewhere else. Here's the newer figure showing the separation of the sciatic and the common fibular tibia. This is your popliteal fossa on the back. Okay, so in about 10 minutes, there will be another midterm review going on. I believe Liam has opened up more sessions for tomorrow, Thursday, from 10 to 12.